Hello everybody. So this time around we're talking about diagnosis and plant disorders. So the big thing or the kind of the first place to start is the idea that trees uh, that are declining or in poor health are usually suffering from a combination of factors. It's, it's never going to be one thing that is uh, causing a tree to have problems. It's always going to be uh, a multitude of factors and an idea that one thing is going to lead to another and then another and another and then that's how you get um, a tree that's that's in decline or a tree that is suffering. So one of the big things uh, about the job of being an arborist is the idea of, of diagnosing um, problems. And what's really, really interesting to me when you're thinking about diagnosing um, diagnosing uh, trees or diagnosing the, the problems with trees is the idea that you really have to um, take into account all, all that you know about the trees. You can't just look at it and take the obvious answer sometimes because the obvious answer might be a secondary cause. So, you know, you're sitting there going, oh, well, look, I can see, I can see bark beetles and bark beetles um, just tore this tree apart. Sure, but why were the bark beetles there in the first place? Because that's your actual problem. The bark beetles are just a secondary issue, but what brought the bark beetles there in the first place? And, and being able to know that or being able to go um, into that sort of analysis is is going to be difficult and it's going to take a lot of experience it's going to take a lot of knowledge it's going to take keen observation not the idea that you can't just the obvious stuff needs to be obvious but then the less obvious stuff you still need to to look for that and it's going to take deductive reasoning to be able to and critical thinking to be able to go from from one from one thing to another and it's really it's really hard to uh to sit here and just kind of go, you're going to have to just look really hard and you're going to have to um, experience it over and over again. You're going to have to really critically think about it. But I think the easier way to just say about it is that when you're diagnosing plant problems, you have to use all of what you know about trees. It, you can't just, just focus on on a couple things that you know it, you have to take into account everything that you know about trees because there's going to be multiple signs or symptoms and you really have to just take them all into account and what could be the reasoning behind that so let's go over the diagnosis process um, we'll go over it right now and then we'll go over each step so accurately identify the plant Identify patterns of abnormality. Carefully examine the site. Notice the color and thickness of the foliage. Check the trunk and branches and then examine the roots and the root collar. So going over the, the steps of diagnosis, we're going to start with the idea of just accurately identifying the plant. So um, for me, really one of the big ideas with accurately identifying the plant is the idea that uh, you got many insects and diseases that are specific to host trees. And so if you really get the tree right, you, that can really kind of help you eliminate choices. And sometimes when critically thinking, um, it's always easy to say, well, just pick the right thing. But sometimes in order to pick the right thing, you've got to eliminate all the wrong things first and i think the 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 big idea with with tree identification and making sure you get the right tree identified is the idea that you can eliminate some of the wrong choices and then really get it down to you know when you when you look at something and you're like well i got a a 50 50 chance or a 25 percent chance you might not think about that and and you might think about that and go well that doesn't sound that great well yeah but what if, if this was one out of a hundred shot or one, or you know, one out of one out of fifty chances, right? Instead, now we're talking about well, I'm down to it's either this or that, or it could be one of these four things. To me, that sounds pretty good if you've if you've narrowed it down. 
we want to look for a pattern of abnormality. So taking this picture to, into account here, this is obviously something that is, um, that is affecting this whole tree. It's not affecting um, only one part of the tree. Sometimes we might see it to where maybe only the outer uh, leaves are being affected or maybe only the bottom part of the canopy or the top part of the canopy. Or um, another way to look for a pattern is there's a tree behind uh, this tree in the picture. Is that tree having any of the same symptoms uh, as this tree here? And those are the sorts of things um, or signs, actually. Uh, or do you see those same signs um, from, from both of those trees? Or is it just specifically this one? And then you can start narrowing down what, what the problem might be. We want to carefully examine the site because we can see right here that we've got um, in these pictures we've got damage to the stem in both of them but both of them are going to be uh, much much different uh, damage uh, on the left we've got we've got um, some sort of um, probably like a weed whacker uh, damage I would I would say because it, it's it's got mower esque damage look to it but the way that the the grass is all laid down and the circular motion of that uh, makes me think something something more um, weed whacker uh, string trimmer esque uh, in terms of the damage and on the right we've got we've got um, damage on the stem as well but that's that's deer that's deer damage and that's something you get used to seeing when you see um, deers rubbing their their velvet on the stem and and what they do um, to get the velvet off of their off of their antlers and that's how you get a, a a deer rub like that so even though you got damage to the stem it's two completely different reasons note the color size and thickness of the foliage right because um the broad uh things that affect broad leaf or things that affect um needle leaf trees or um those are going to be different and then just the idea of of the the leaves itself so what's happening so say we're just looking at all the leaves of the same plant do we see a, a difference in the color of the of the leaves at this part of the plant versus this part of the plant or or a difference in in size um for some reason this side of the plant or this or um the top of the crown has really good growth but the bottom of the crown has much smaller leaves than it should and and the thickness of the foliage is all the foliage feel the same or does some of it feel different that's that's going to help us in in trying to deduce what what we're dealing with and then checking the trunk and the branches so uh explain the idea of deer rubs before there's a good example of a of a deer doing it and and the different kind of damage uh, that it might create sometimes it's a little bit sometimes it's a lot of it it just kind of it just kind of depends on on what's going on but we always want to check the trunk and the branches to see uh, is it localized to one area or is it spreading throughout the tree and then just like we want to check the trunk and the branches we want to check the roots and the root collar um, the book talks about the idea that healthy looking uh, roots if we um, if we cut them open a little bit we should see white on the inside whereas if you see brown or black we have um, we have uh, either aeration issues or water issues and that could um, be really problematic for the plant we also want to look for any girdling roots make sure there's no roots that are base that are basically choking um our tree out so make sure that you that you check for that but we want to try and check up above and we want to look at all this other stuff before we get down to checking the roots the problem um might might be underground because a lot for these trees happens underground but because you have to disturb the site so much we really want that to be uh the last step in the process so let's go over some some basic symptoms and signs uh, like I wrote down here trees cannot talk but they can give us clues and so we if they're gonna give us clues we got to be able to look at the clues and and understand what they mean like when we see 
you look at these leaves right here in this picture some of them have some yellowing we see obviously the black spots what is that what is the tree trying to tell us so let's go over a few different types so we're going to start off just first the idea of symptoms and signs so symptoms are effects of the causal agent uh, the effects of the causal agent are apparent on the tree so we've got things like leaf spot, canker, chlorosis, dieback, and witch's broom are, are um, some good examples of uh, symptoms. In terms of signs, when we're talking about signs, it's a they are direct indications from the causal agent. So some examples of signs would be conks or fruiting bodies or, or exit holes. So if we look here on the right, we can see some front fungus fruiting bodies. So we know that there's uh, an obvious problem happening in this tree down here. We've got an entrance hole for bark beetles, and we see some um, some sap exudation. So those are the type of things that that are are really obvious signs and not so much symptoms. And so let's go over a bunch of common symptoms and signs. So the first one we're going to look at is blight, and the idea of blight. Is that you get a dieback of leaves and twigs on major portions of the tree especially the young uh, growing tissues so you'll see because uh, we'll talk about dieback as well but when we're talking about blight we're talking about um, a major portion of of the tree so dieback you might just get a certain area but um, with a blight you should get dieback of the leaves and the and the twigs on major portions of the tree and so it says especially the young growing tissue so it should always start on the outside working towards the center of the tree a canker is a lo is localized dead stem tissue uh, often often shrunken and discolored so here's two examples of of cankers chlorosis you've got a yellowing of normally green tissues due to a lack of chlorophyll so Whenever you see yellowing leaves, and it's not just the idea of that's what this leaf does, if this leaf should be normally green and now it's yellowed, that's chlorosis. Decay. So with decay, we get decomposition of rotting wood tissue, and there's all sorts of different versions of decay. You know, you might just see a little crack and, and be able to look in there and say, oh yeah, it doesn't look good in there, or this one is the nice and obvious one where we got all these fungal fruiting bodies uh, hanging out here which means that inside we definitely have a bunch of rot happening and then we might have something where we can see old wounds and knowing that the old wound is there we probably have um, some sort of issue in in our our trunk as well and if we look up in the canopy uh, hopefully that will kind of give us an idea of um, that there might be some decay uh, within our tree so dieback, so progressive death of twigs and leaves from the tip back. Usually when we're talking about dieback as opposed to blight, we're really focused on the idea of crown dieback, like you can see here, where we've got green tissue and this tree is still alive. We got green leaves and all that, but up here at the top, we don't, we don't have that. Um, and we got a little bit here on the side as well. And you can see it kind of down there as well, but we still have some green tissue and basically the tree this tree is suffering and so it's kind of pulling back um, from the from the outside in and trying to trying to protect itself it still needs to put leaves out there it still needs to try and uh, grow and create energy as much as it can but there's certain parts of the tree it just doesn't want to uh, spend the effort to anymore and that's the idea of dieback a gall is swollen plant tissue or a regular plant growth that may be induced by insects, mites, fungi, bacteria, or nematodes. Uh, on the valley oaks that we have on the on the campus, there at BC on the main campus, you'll see uh, you'll see insect galls uh, all over the place. Looks like looks like there's a bunch of fruit uh, growing on the on the oak tree. But we know that acorn, and this is going back to the idea of putting in all of your knowledge that you have about trees. Uh, you can see those those what look like fruiting bodies on on the valley oaks, but actually, what you what you, you sit there and go, well, yeah, but the but a valley oak has an acorn, and I know that it should be an acorn that looks like this, 
And then when you realize that you've got these fruiting body looking things, then you're like, okay, well, what is this? And eventually you'll get to, to a gall, which is a swollen panic tissue. And uh, in this case, it, it's um, induced by insects in the specific case of the valley oak. Uh, gamosis. Gamosis is exudation of sap or gum from wounds or other openings on the bark, as you can see on the left side of this tree over here and down below. Leaf blotch, so you get dead areas of tissue on the foliage, uh, irregular in shape and larger than leaf spots. So if we just had some spots, um, that would be that would that wouldn't be blotch. But you can see like we have a lot of just big irregular shaped areas um, within this within this leaf and that's that's would qualify as leaf blotch and then of course leaf spot which we just said should be smaller is spots of dead tissue on the foliage the size shape and color may vary with the causal agent but are usually limited to small portions of the leaf and so this is a great example right here of leaf spot and we got a couple other examples of leaf spot as well Necrosis is just the death of plant tissue. So if we see um, these these uh, leaves wilting and curling and then uh, ultimately dying, the, the, the dying part is necrosis. Powdery mildew, so white or grayish fungal growth, um, which is actually mycelium, uh, on the surface of plant tissues, uh, usually the leaves. And you can see some really good examples of the of powdery mildew. Rust, orange or reddish brown pustules on leaves or fruit, or galls and cankers on stems caused by certain fungi. And so you can see some really good examples of, of rust and rust coloring and what that looks like on the leaves. Uh, leaf scorch, which is the browning and death of indefinite areas along the leaf margins and or between the veins. And um, with with leaf scorch you get it's much more browning than the than the spotting or the or the blotching and you can get um, death in you can get some necrosis in in a few of these areas so you get it's much more on the margins so on the the outer portion of the of the leaf as well as um, along the or in between the veins Stunting, so you get abnormally small um, plant growth. This could be because of what's happening in an urban setting, or you know, if we have a more a little more um, uh, environmentally unfriendly setting, like what this uh, pine tree has to deal with. You know, sitting on top of a an exposed uh, part of a mountainside where it's just getting battered by wind and and possibly snow uh, over and over again is going to keep it growing that way. Whereas here, we're probably starting to think about, well, what what's going on with the environmental conditions? What's going on with the amount of water? Um, you know, we talked about looking for the looking for the pattern. Well, what I see in the pattern is I want to think about like, are all these trees the so go back even one step I accurately identify the plant so are all these trees the same tree or is this a different type of tree because if it's a different type of tree maybe it's not supposed to grow as huge as the other ones and maybe it's supposed to be smaller but if they're all the same tree and then uh, I figure that part out and then I say okay well now I'm looking at these these trees uh, next to it much bigger um, much bigger trunk much darker leaves now we start to say, okay, well now what's happening and what could be happening? Um, what, why are those ones fine, but this one's not? And it's that sort of stuff that we want to try and look at um, if we're trying to, to establish a pattern. You also have vascular discoloration, which is darkening of the wood's vascular elements, often along the growth rings. You can have wilt, which is the drooping of leaves or shoots, often due to lack of water in leaves. And you got witch's broom, which is an abnormal development of multiple secondary shoots forming a broom-like effect. And you can see that clearly right here in this picture. So then um, we've got all these signs and symptoms, but what are these signs and uh, symptoms 
trying to tell us. And that really starts getting into the idea of plant disorders. And we're going to have um, two basic uh Two basic categories of disorders. We're going to have biotic disorders and abiotic disorders. So with biotic disorders, you've got living agents such as pathogens and insects. Uh, so what, what qualifies as pathogens and insects? Fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes, um, insects, mites, and other animals. Uh, if we're talking about abiotic, which is the idea of non-living agents, so things like temperature, moisture, um, um, mechanical things, chemical, um, chemical, uh, injuries or, uh, chemical toxicities, nutrient deficiencies, the, all these sorts of things that are all the non-living agents that could, um, possibly be causing a disorder. But if we're going to talk about disorders, we really got to understand the idea of stress. And when we're talking about stress, we're talking about any condition that can cause a decline in, uh, the health of the tree. And so there's going to be two types of stress. There's going to be acute stress, which is going to occur suddenly, and the effects are immediate. Uh, and then we've got chronic, which are uh, which is not going to occur suddenly. It's going to take a longer time to have an effect, and the effects are not going to be um, immediate, and they're not going to be obvious. And they may, in fact, uh, and this gets back to the beginning where we started, where it's the combination of factor. It, with chronic stress, we may not even it may be really hard to figure out what caused the problem in the first place because there's going to be so many um, different things that happen to this tree that we're not even going to be sure how to get back to, to the starting point. So let's look at acute stress. So that's stress that occurs suddenly and causes almost immediate damage. So something like uh, freeze damage, um, uh, which just right away happens and... Um, it's obvious, you know, your plant was, your plant or your tree was fine. All of a sudden you had a hard freeze and then you go out there, uh, the next week and you see something like this happen. It's obvious that there, it was fine before. Now all of a sudden you had this, this, um, weather related, um, event happen and then now you have a result. So, uh, acute and immediate, uh, um, effects. Herbicide damage. You went and you know, sprayed herbicide. Um, then, you know, you waited um, a week or so. And then all of a sudden now you notice this has happened. And so that's one of the, that's just, there's an obvious cause and effect. And so with acute tree, st tree st stress, that's what we're looking for is with that immediate damage, that obvious cause and effect. It was fine. Now it's not. And this was the one difference. With chronic stress, it's gonna take, it takes a longer time to affect tree health. Um, you can have things like nutrient deficiency, soil pH, poor drainage, poor drainage, soil compaction, those sorts of things where it just takes a toll on the tree after, um, after a while, right? Maybe we get some, uh, some crown dieback happening. Maybe we get, uh, some wilting of our leaves or, or some sparseness in our canopy. We get some dead or flaking bark. We've got some um, some suckers or some witch's brooms popping up. We get fungal fruiting bodies in part of a tree. We get maybe a branch to drop, and all the while we're we we're you know well is it this or is it that? And it might just be this long term problem that we didn't even know about, and that we're finally just seeing the the kind of the end of that as opposed to um, some just new problem that just popped up. And so it's it's really hard with chronic tree stress, stress to try and figure out what it is exactly that's happening and how long it's been happening to the tree. Uh, here's just kind of uh, one idea of that where we're looking right here and we see these uh, basement foundations or driveways, whatever it is, restricting the root system of this tree. So in the urban environment, you can also get um, heavy competition from grass. And um, so, you know, this tree may look fine, but then all of a sudden, if this tree starts having issues, well, is it, uh, is it an issue of competition with the grass? Is it an issue of the roots uh, being restricted and not being able to uh, get what they need? Is it an issue of the uh, houses next door causing uh, extra heating? 
or or uh, restricting some branches from getting the sunlight that they need is it a watering issue there's all sorts of different things um, that could be causing could be causing the problem uh, if we look right here trying to figure out specifically that this tree is suffering under um, suffering from drought stress okay so if we're looking at what we see we see kind of some some sparseness uh, of leaves we see some some leaves that are dead we look down here and we see that it's it's kind of dry so we've got you know if i told you that's drought stress you can kind of look at this tree and go yeah i see those sorts of things that that make me think that it's drought stress but now take out the words drought stress and now just have it be all right well there's some some leaves that have died we've got some um, sparseness in the canopy uh the stem looks okay you know the ground down there is dry but um but i see all the you know the grass around it is green and you know i'm looking around i don't see any other trees uh to compare it to or that are suffering in the same way all the other ones seem fine then all of a sudden drought stress doesn't become as obvious or or as apparent and it's, it's really about the idea of trying to trying to nail down um do we have an obvious cause and effect like like an acute stress does or is this a chronic problem um where it's it's you know it's been building up over time and we really got to think about how did we get here and what were all the steps that got us here or what are all the things that could combine and cause us problems and then let's just start trying to see if we can eliminate any of uh, of that laundry list that we come up with and so now which what we've been building to is the idea of these these disorders uh that we have to deal with so we're going to talk about uh abiotic or the non-living uh, agents causing non-infectious issues we're going to talk about abiotic disorders first so running through kind of a the list environmental problems like pollution temperature moisture exchange soil and site problems physical and mechanical injury competition and allelopathy chemical injury and girdling roots so with your soil and site problems if we just take a look at something like this uh especially with the idea of urban uh forestry is the idea of looking at this and saying well what possible soil and site problems could you be talking about how about this one that's a pretty big trunk uh, I'm willing to bet that tree has a pretty big crown and if it's got a pretty big crown it's got a pretty big root system and the only part of that root system that isn't covered up by concrete is all of a few is is a few feet uh, to to each side so to me already I'm looking at this and going all right well there's gonna definitely be some soil and site issues right because also the only exposed soil so in terms of water and moisture from precipitation and and that happening is going to be on this tiny little bit of soil and so we we're definitely thinking soil and site issues there here's some other examples of um, when we're thinking about urban forestry specifically in the idea of these trees growing in parks and in the middle of town and all that is where are these roots going to grow and how how are they where's the soil um, that they're trying to uh, access and and how is how is this tree supposed to survive and so soil and site problems are definitely something uh, that we should that we need to consider physical and mechanical injury so um, specifically a lot of times lawnmower damage or you can see um, this tree is not getting enough water so it's bringing its roots to the surface and then the roots are getting damaged um, um, by uh, mower or trimmer or that sort of a thing and uh, the big thing with with physical and mechanical injury is is it's easily preventable if we if we're on uh, if we have a good system set up in terms of making sure that our trees get enough water and then secondly uh, making sure that we don't allow the grass or whatever else is growing it needs to be maintained to come right up to the tree uh, to the to the trunk of the tree so making sure we you know we leave a little uh, a little area around it and then maybe we put uh, mulch in that area so that way it's something that that keeps um, string trimmers or um, or mowers 
out from the from the trunk and then we don't have to worry about problems like this happening that are that are gonna um, ruin the system uh, within our tree uh, weather related issues you know hurricane uh, type issues lightning uh, 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 big big freeze events or, or frost events uh, ice storms those sorts of things all of these sorts of things that could possibly happen that are weather related and what are the different issues that we're gonna have and and how do you how do you deal with them especially in an urban setting uh, the, you can have all depending on where you are all sorts of weather related problems and and different weather related problems right if you live in uh in Ge atlanta georgia you're not going to have the same weather related problems that you do living in bakersfield california so it just really uh, depends sometimes where you are and just understanding what are the local weather patterns and what are the types of things that you can expect to have problems with competition and allelopathy so competition we've talked about um, before and the idea of shade tolerant trees and shade intolerant trees and the idea of how intolerant trees want to grow uh, quickly and get to the sun first and then tolerant trees are willing to hang out in the shade of the other tree and um, once that tree because it's usually a faster growing tree but doesn't live as long disappears off then they're going to come up and and take the spot so we're cut good with the idea of competition now what about this idea of allelopathy so allelopathy is uh the chemical inhibition of a of a of a plant by another plant and so um for trees uh, one tree that that people like to have as a as a landscape tree is a black walnut tree also a tree of high value uh, in terms of it provides fruit but then also provides a really nice really expensive uh, wood so uh, black walnut really um, big on on the idea of allelopathy and if other trees get too close it actually has um, toxic chemicals that are produced by the tree um, by the tree roots that'll kill off any of the other um, plants and in this case trees that get too close to it so it's basically it's kind of um, kind of wants to it wants its own space and if you get too close it's gonna it's going to make sure that you you understand that you were too close uh, and and so the black walnut is one of the most well-known uh, allelopathic plants that we have and so it it basically causes uh reduced growth or wilt or um or necrosis in in other plants that get close to too close to it uh air pollution damage or any sort of um pollution damage um due to you know all the all the chemicals and all the um greenhouse gases that we're putting uh out into our atmosphere and the idea of, of how that um how that can affect plants because you gotta you gotta remember even though we don't really see it plants are doing gaseous exchange at all times and uh, and these leaves have their stomata open and taking in gases and 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 expelling um gas and so they're going to take in whatever's put into the atmosphere so plants can definitely suffer from air pollution damage you can also have um, chemical injury you can also have water availability issues so just the idea of of kind of drought related issues or um or planting the wrong kind of species in the wrong kind of area meaning if you have a more xeric area where you need really drought tolerant plants and then you pull you know you go and put a plant there that's going to you know that needs a ton of water and all of a sudden it's, it's just struggling you know or if you plant something like a salt cedar or a tamarisk that's going to suck up all the water in the available area and then all your other plants start suffering meanwhile this plant's doing just fine those are the sorts of things that um that you want to really think about uh in terms of water availability and then girdling roots the idea of sometimes uh roots if we don't pay attention to them or we don't um look at them that they can actually be causing just as much of a problem uh, in the tree as any of these other things and really want to avoid any of these circular roots that can kind of choke out the tree and cause us huge problems in terms of our biotic disorders 
we're really talking about living agents um, that are that are going to cause uh, infectious disease. So um, they so plant pathogens, so causal agents of a of a disease. So you've got uh, fungi, bacteria, viruses, phytoplasmas, parasitic plants, nematodes, insect pests, mites, and other animals that can be spreading um, these pathogens from place to place. And the pathogens are infectious and they can spread from one plant to the next and cause us uh, huge problems. And so in terms of looking at insects and other pests, numerous insects can be found on a tree. They're not all going to be harmful. Some are going to feed on a variety of hosts. Some are going to feed on specific hosts. And it's really important to know the life cycle um, of, of the insects. Um, most of your damage uh, with insects is going to occur either through their um, their feeding or through uh, their egg laying. Uh, in the background here is, uh, is a bark beetle gallery. And that's the idea of um, them feeding on the tree and how they um, how they um, cause these galleries to occur with your insect damage you can have all sorts of different things uh, happening um, you can have it to where they're chewing on plant parts um, and all sorts of different ways so skeletonized where they're going on intervenal tissue leaf miners they're going to tunnel between the leaf surfaces borers they're going to tunnel under the bark and into the wood uh, you got some that are um, piercing and sucking. They have piercing and sucking parts. They suck the contents of the plant cell out. And so knowing that there are all these different types of insect damage and then looking specifically at um, the parts of the plant that were damaged and trying to figure out, well, did they bore in there? Did they, um, did they tunnel between the leaf surfaces? Did they suck the contents out of the plant? So what specifically happened? there to be able to uh, tell us what what kind of insects we might be dealing with or at least eliminate all the ones that we wouldn't be dealing with as well in terms of vectors if a vector is a carrier of plant pathogens um, so in this uh, specific instance that we have here the we've got the european elm beetle and the european elm beetle is the vector for transmitting dutch elm disease so dutch elm disease is really problematic uh for for our elm trees but it's all starts with the european elm beetle and it's um and it's bringing of the plant pathogen with it uh here's just another example so pathogens are those living agents that cause disease we've kind of talked about that and then we have our vector and so uh with this picture that we have here on the right we've got tree damage caused by fungi associated with wood boring insects so if we look at this whole beetle life cycle, so it, it begins by following uh, the hatching of an egg in a maternal gallery, which is a tunnel uh, under the tree bark. The larva remains in the tunnel. It's going to feed on the phloem and gnaw uh, tunnels during the stage. The fungi grow and sporulate and can serve as a source of nutrition for the beetle larvae. The larvae pupate and develop into adults under the bark, and then they fly in search of new host trees and transport that fungi with them from that tree. The fungal spores carried on their exoskeleton um, in these specialized structures called mycangia um, are then inoculated into a new host tree, and you start the whole process over again. And it's the fungi, I mean, the, the insects uh, are causing a problem but it's the fungi that is really um, it's the it's the combination of both right maybe one of those two things it could have the tree could have compartmentalized and survived but having both the insect damage happening and the fungi uh, spreading throughout the tree really um, makes it so that the tree can't survive and the tree can't compartmentalize quick enough and fast enough to, to avoid the problem. And that's the idea of, of both the, the pathogen and the vector and, and the biotic disorder of how it all works together. Some other uh, um, vectors that we have, we've got mites. Um, mites are a type of arachnid that primarily damages trees by sucking leaf fluid uh, or forming galls. Nematodes are microscopic worm-like creatures that when present typically attack root systems 
but they're also beneficial in the decay process. So you got some nematodes that are great, some nematodes that are super problematic. But, you know, that's kind of everything. You got some good stuff and you got some bad stuff. There are four requirements that are necessary for a tree to become diseased. You need a susceptible host, so you need something that's um, that's um, going to um, fall fall uh, victim to this. You need a pathogen pathogenic organism, so you need something that's going to spread a pathogen. You need an environmental suitable for disease development, so you need the right factors in the environment that let that disease happening, and then of course the right timing. The idea that that all of this just falls into place perfectly is how you end up with with a um, disease uh, in terms of fungi fungi are really important to talk about because they are responsible for the majority of plant diseases so here's that um, we talked about dutch elm disease before with that european elm beetle um, that's caused by a fungus uh, apple cedar rust here that we see in this picture also caused by by a fungus and like we like we said uh, fungi are responsible for the majority of plant diseases now if you're sitting there going well we've also um you know in other classes and stuff we've talked about mycorrhizae and that's that's fungi on the roots then that actually helps out the tree yeah just like we talked about in the slide before there are some good <laughs> there's some good parts of things and, and bad parts of things fungi um there are good there are good uh, fungus and they're a bad fungus but um, they're when we when we think about um, plant disease uh, fungi are responsible for the majority of plant diseases you also have um, bacteria and bacteria can cause three main diseases uh, fire blight bacterial leaf scorch and crown gall and so here's an example of fire blight uh, in the picture uh, down here on the right and so bacteria is uh, if you can narrow it down to the idea of like fire blight, bacterial leaf scorch, crown gall, well then we know that it was a bacteria that caused that disease. And if we and um, we also have viruses as well. And viruses can cause disease diseases such as ring spot uh, and yellowing. Uh, it, they, the viruses are frequently spread by insects. They often require a wound for entry, so um, we said that idea uh, before about spreading disease of having the susceptible host. So with the viruses, you need that wound. You already need the tree to have an issue, and then it can uh, work its way into the system. Uh, viruses, though, in trees are seldom fatal. And so when we just think about, uh, about trees, about trying to diagnose um, trying to look for signs and symptoms and then um, having uh, an understanding of abiotic and biotic disorders. We really just try and look at a tree and put the whole um, the whole thing together. So looking at the idea of, you know, well, you know, here's a canker and here's some broken roots and um, the root, I can see some roots popping out of the ground at the bottom and I can see some dieback in the crown and start looking for you know do i see any any holes on the trees do i see any spots of decay or do i see any fungal fruiting bodies or do i see any um entry holes for for any insects or um, do i see any animals living within this tree or you just have to honestly put it all together put all your knowledge together and really try and think about the problem holistically and think about everything that you know and everything that you can see and every bit of information you can find and put it together and that's going to be um, your best diagnosis and your best version and if you don't get to the right answer that's fine you're just going to need more experience and maybe you need to go find somebody with more experience who can get you to the right answer until you have that experience and that's what i got for you so hope you enjoyed it